Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. It's good to see you today. It's great to be here today. I'm glad to be anywhere today. Especially grateful to be here with you today. And uh, my pastor is, uh, is spending more money than he has down in Atlanta. And uh, uh, just uh, grateful for, for Pastor Mike and Denise and their leadership here. And uh, uh, in this month of... Uh, of honoring them, I hope you'll just do extra, 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 because there's no way that you can even understand the magnitude of what it is to, to lead a church in these days and, and the challenges uh, that are there. So uh, be as generous as you can, and he didn't pay me to say that. Uh, I work with pastors all over this country, and I know uh, your pastor and his ministry and his leadership, and, uh, and so grateful to just add my word of admonition to you today to, to honor your pastor and uh, to bless them. We're living in very challenging times in our nation and in our world. And in spite of that, the Lord is working in His church uh, to do incredible things. And this morning, I want to take you to Revelation chapter 1. To Revelation chapter 1. And... Uh, Hear the encounter that John, the apostle, had uh, with the Lord Jesus. If you, if you have a Bible or an iPad or something, uh, uh, verse 9, Je Revelation chapter 1. Let me read a few verses for you. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient trip endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, per Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head were white like wool, as white as snow, and his f eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like fine bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The book of Revelation begins with this incredible revelation that John received. Now, John is the last of the living apostles. There were 12 original ones. And uh, Jesus spent three and a half years spending most of his time with 12 guys. That should tell some of us something. Of those 12 guys, there were three that were kind of the, the favorites. Peter, James, and John. Remember them? Peter, James, and John. You know, I can just see Jesus saying to the disciples, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John and I are going to go off for the weekend. You guys try to stay out of trouble while we're gone. And I can hear Matt saying to Bart, they ever ask you to go with them? No. I can also hear Matt saying to Thomas, they ever ask you to go? And he said, no, doubt they ever will. <laughs> but the last of the living is John. And I believe God knew who would be the last one alive because he spent more time with John than he did the other 11. And John is the last of the living, and he has now been placed on a, a deserted island out to, uh, in the middle of the, the sea uh, uh, near present-day Turkey and uh, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. One of the things I, I appreciate about what John says to us as we begin this dialogue about these verses John says, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. You know, John could have introduced himself, well, I am the last of the living apostles and, uh, and given us his resume, but he didn't. What he said was, hey, I'm just like the rest of you. Yeah. 
I got trouble too. He had a little more trouble than most of us have. He is now deserted on this island with guards around him. Now he is 80, 85 years of age. This is not the retirement program he had planned. Where is Medicaid when you need it? You know what I mean? I am the last of the living apostles. I'm like, come on, I deserve better than this. I, need a, I, I should be in, in a very nice assisted living in Charlotte. But he's not. He's deserted on an island. And John makes a decision. And it's a decision that we need to make today. And that is this. Are you going to let your circumstances dictate how you respond? Are you going to let what's going on right now in your life decide on your attitude? See, John had every reason to be ticked off. He had every reason to spend the last days of his life kicking pebbles on Patmos. Don't sit there so pious. You know what I'm talking about. But he makes a decision. And that decision is, I refuse to let my circumstances dictate how I'm going to respond. And so the Scripture says, He was in the presence of the Lord on the Lord's day. How many know any day that you come and worship God, He's present? Yes. Amen. Six of you so far, okay. <laughs> when you're out on 77, the presence of God can be with you. Yeah. You didn't have to come here today to feel God's presence. He doesn't dwell in this room. He doesn't dwell in this building. He dwells right here. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He dwells, he, he, he dwells in these temples. And so he says to John, as John begins to worship, as John begins to have church, he's on this island, he's by himself, and so he decides just to have church. Some of you missed a real good worship service already this morning. You sat there. You missed it. John's having church. And all of a sudden, I am Alpha and Omega. And John's like, oh my God. Could Jesus, that, that voice sounds real familiar. Could Jesus actually be here on this island with me? I am Alpha and Omega. I am He who is dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And John's kind of shaken. I mean, I thought I was here with a couple of guards. Could Jesus actually be here? Somebody listen to me this morning. I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what's going on in your life. Jesus will show up if you'll acknowledge him. Come on. So John's got a decision to make right now. Do I dare turn and, and look? And the Bible says that, Scripture says that he turned and he describes, and I read to you what he saw, this incredible vision of Jesus. You know, I get amused at some church people. They say, well, I'll tell you what, when I get to heaven, I got three questions for God. Really? You know, I can just see you sashaying right up into the presence of God. God, I have two questions Listen, honey, if you get to heaven, you won't have questions. Because everybody who ever encountered the glorified Jesus was not, didn't have their hands on their hips. They were on their face. Yeah. Isaiah said, woe is me from a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. If you get there, things will be plain and clear. And John said, when I saw him, 
I fell in front of him like a dead man. The response in this moment is what I think one of the most incredible things that happens in this story. Jesus could have said, that's where you belong, John, on your face. Because I know who you are, and I know your mistakes, and I know your failures, and you don't deserve to be in my presence. Somebody's going to get this in a minute. John said, I fell in front of him like a dead man. But he reached out to me with his right hand. And he put it on my shoulder. And he said, John, don't be afraid. Are you, the mic must not be on. He said, John, don't be afraid. I am he who was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, John, I didn't come here to beat up on you. I didn't come here to tell you what's wrong with you. I didn't come here today to slap you around. John, I came here today to touch you and to bless you. He reached his right hand out to me. Don't be afraid, John. You see the glory and the majesty of who I am. But don't be afraid. I'm Jesus, the risen Son of God. Amen. And I came here to touch you. You see, when you, when you look at this passage of Scripture, and you're going to see what begins to happen as, as the Lord Jesus He's got a message for every church here of the seven churches, and all, those are churches all over Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. Real places and real churches. There are two things that come to mind to me as you, you're reading this and looking at this. Number one is, the Lord is saying, it is my church, and I'm going to keep talking to my church. It is my church. I'm going to keep messing with it. I'm going to keep speaking to it. You see, if God leaves you alone, sir, you need to get worried. Good. As long as God's still messing with you, there's hope for you. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, John, I want my church to understand this is my church. Hope church belongs to Jesus. Well, I could have got more amens there. I said, Hope Church belongs to Jesus. Amen. Come on, somebody talk to me here. Right. It's his church. He died for this church. Amen. He died for these people. He died for all of us today. He said, John, I want you to understand this is my church, and I'm going to keep talking to it. I'm going to keep messing with it. I'm going to keep speaking to it. And that's a good thing, church. I said, That's a good thing. The second thing, you see it's already up on the screen. He said, I want my church to see the future. With the events that have happened in the last 10 days in our world, it's important for us to know this morning that the Lord has things in hand. Yeah. Amen. That He has things in hand. I want my church to see the future. And so, in other words, what he's saying, John, John, I want my church to go ahead and sing the Hallelujah Chorus. I'm he who is dead, but I'm alive forevermore. So go ahead and rejoice, church. Jesus has conquered. Go ahead and rejoice, church. The kingdoms of this world will one day become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. Every knee will bow one day. Mohammed will bow. Joseph Smith will bow. Every demonic force in this world will bow and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, if you really got that, you'd be on top of the chair right now. Just so you know. 
So I want my church, John, to understand those two things. First of all, I'm going to keep talking to it and messing with it. Number two, I want my church to go ahead and start rejoicing. Go ahead and start rejoicing, church, because Jesus has conquered all of it. And so he comes to John, this incredible revelation. And he says something three times here. You know, if, if the Lord says something three times, he must be trying to get a message through to somebody. He says, John, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In case you don't understand what that means, because that's the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. If you don't understand that, let me just say this again, John. I am the first and the last. And if you need further explanation, I'm the beginning and the end. What he's trying to say to John and to the church, I was there when we spoke the worlds into existence, John. I was there when this all started, John. But here's what you need to understand. I'm going to also be there when this ends. I'm the first, but I'm also the last. I'm going to have the last word, John. War is raging in the Middle East tonight or today. There are answers we don't have, and we are seeing um, possibly prophecy being lived out in front of us. Read the rest of Revelation. But he said, John, I want, I want you to understand that I'm going to be there when this all ends. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that the Lord's already been in my tomorrows. Why would you want to go, go it on your own next week when you could get help? Why would, you, why would you want to just march into next week and next month and next year on your own because you don't know what tomorrow holds? I said, you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what next week's going to bring. But he does. And he says, if you'll let me, I'll walk you into those tomorrows. See, he knows where the potholes are. He, he can walk you around that trouble. He can walk you around that circumstance. He can walk you around that situation. Because he knows tomorrow. Why would you want to go into tomorrow, next week, or next year without him? He knows tomorrow. John, I'm going to be here when it all ends. I'm the first and I'm the last, I'm the beginning, and I'm the end. I'm he who is dead, but I'm alive forevermore, John. Hallelujah. Amen. Pardon me if I get excited. Oh, Jesus. That's how he begins his dialogue with the with all those in the church of seven churches, all represented by churches of, of all time. And so the, the, the point of, of this encounter, first of all, was to say to John, John, whatever you're going through, whatever battle you're facing, whatever circumstance you're, you're dealing with, I'm with you. You're not in this alone, John. If you'll acknowledge me, if you'll worship me, you're going to see me. You see, the problem with so many people today, because I, you know, I, I talk to people every week all over the country, uh, is that you know, I ask them, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. <laughs> see, that's your problem. You're under the circumstances. Yeah. God doesn't want you to live under the circumstances. God wants you to live on top of your circumstances. Well, you just don't know what I'm going through, Ron. Well, I don't, but God does. You don't know the battle I'm facing right now, Ron. I don't, but God does. 
He's able. He's capable. I am he who was dead, John, but I'm alive forevermore. And I've got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. You know, up the road in Winston where I pastored for uh, 17 years, uh, we built a lot of buildings on, on the property. And uh, at the begin with, we weren't smart enough to key all the buildings together. <laughs> so we had keys to every place on the property. You know, I didn't want the keys. I got amused that church people, I'd like to have a key. Really? That means you're going to be responsible when something is missing. I didn't want the keys. I'm the lead pastor. I don't want the keys. I just want to know the guy who has the keys. There's a sermon right there for somebody. So I'm over one day uh, in the, the, by the youth building, and I want to get into this area over here. And uh, so I called Don, who is our, our building supervisor. He's over the properties, and you know, he's got 52 keys. You know, like, you know how a guy like that, he just walks like this with, the, with that key ring with 52 keys, you know? And so Don says, I'll be right there, Pastor. And so he, he gets over to where I'm at and hands me the set of keys. And I start in. When I got smart, I said, Don, open the door. <laughs> Did you know of 52 keys, he knew which one fit that room? He knew the keys. Yeah. Right. Come on. He knew the keys. He'd open that door. And you know, people all the time talking about, well, you know, I'll tell you the key to this situation. I'll tell you the key. To Listen. Jesus has the keys. Yeah. Come on. I said Jesus has the keys. Yeah. You know what? He's got the key to unlock that financial difficulty you're in right now. Yeah. He's got the key to unlock that emotional... See, there's some, some of us are still battling from COVID. I mean, I had it a few weeks ago. But some of us have came out of COVID with depression and you just continue to have a cloud over you. You can't seem to break free of it. Did you know Jesus has the key to unlock that? Yes. He has the key to unlock that family situation that you have no idea how to handle. He has the keys. When he was put in a borrowed tomb, the Bible says he went into the pit of hell and he took from Satan the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he triumphed three days later. And he said, John, I am he who is dead, but I'm alive forevermore, and I've got the keys to unlock every situation. There's not a circumstance. Come on, somebody listen to me. There's not a situation you're facing. There's not a circumstance you're going through that he does not have the key for it. Amen. That he doesn't have the ability to unlock that issue, to unlock that problem, to unlock that circumstance he has the keys. I am he who is dead, but I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys. And so whatever the circumstances are, John gives us a great model today you can be become angry. You can become bitter. You know what I said to my family? I'm going to die a sweet old man. <laughs> you know why I said that to him? Because I've seen too many bitter old men. Yeah. <clears throat> See, what's going on between your ears is going to determine how you live your days. Yeah. And you may feel like you're on an island like John was, but here's how you get victory over the island. You get in the presence of God. It's good. You can let the circumstances... You know, see, not only do you know your circumstances, everybody else does too, because you've been on Facebook. 
You've been on Twitter. All of Charlotte knows your problem. Everybody knows your issue. You've taken it to everybody except the one who can fix it. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you wish those that needed this were here today? <laughs> and the Lord says, I'm here. Several years ago, as a pastor, I was scheduled for a, hurting, uh, a routine hernia repair surgery. And you know how you go the day before and they, uh, they do blood work and they check your lungs and see if they're clear for anesthesia and, and uh, that's what they, they did. I was in the hospital up there in Winston-Salem and uh, I came back to my office and I'm working in the afternoon and I get a call from my doctor and he said, Pastor, uh, when's the last time you had a chest x-ray? I said, well, I said I had a physical three months ago. I don't think they did an x-ray. He said, well, the x-ray they, had, they took this morning at the hospital reveals you've got a mass in your chest. We've canceled your procedure for tomorrow. There's something far more serious going on in your body. I had no symptoms. I had no pain. And I was in a state of shock. Next day, scans. The next day, biopsies. And one of the longest weeks of my life brought me to a Friday morning where the doctor said, as he called me, he said, Pastor, you have lymphoma cancer. We believe it's stage four. The cancer's through your whole body. You have two tumors in your chest the size of grapefruits that are just shy of invading all of your lung cavity. You know, when you get that phone call, life gets simple. You know, when I got that phone call, it didn't matter what, what kind of truck I drove. Right. It's true. Come on, somebody. It's true. It didn't matter what kind of house I lived in. Yeah. It didn't matter how much money was in my 401k, 501c, 602B. It didn't matter what any of those programs. <laughs> the only thing that mattered in that moment was my relationship to God yes. and to my family and to my church family that I knew would stand with me. I went through the most intense six months of chemo that they can give a person. And by the way, at my house, 24-7 through six months was worship music being played 24-7 in my house. I understand what, what John understands. It has been very easy to give up in the middle of it because I was so weak I could hardly walk. But every two weeks, I'd take chemo on Mondays, and they would fill me full of all this poison. And by the end of the week, I would crash. But the next week, I'd start building a little bit of strength back, and I'd go to church and preach. I stood in the green room outside off the platform, and the elders of our church would pour oil, anointing oil over me, and anoint me. And I walked out on those Sundays and preach like a man from another world. I know what it means to, for his strength to be perfect in your weakness. Yeah, and I refused. I refused to let the cancer decide who I was. Come on, somebody needs to get this in a second here. I kept worshiping. I kept praising God. I kept thanking him. I played worship music 24-7 in my house. Yeah. And I walked through six months of hell. You know, I like that country song that says, when you're going through hell, don't slow down because you may get through before the devil knows you're there. <laughs> it's a great country song. As I walked through hell... I walked in victory. Yeah. I said I walked in victory. 
So I don't want you sitting here today, some of you just sitting here today saying, well, you know, he don't really understand. Really? Trust me, sir, I understand. Trust me, ma'am, I understand. So I'm not just preaching a sermon, I'm sharing a message today. Because there are people in this room that are walking through hell. There are people in this room that are walking through challenges and difficulties. And I came here today to, today to tell you you're not alone if you'll just acknowledge Jesus in the middle of it. Yeah. And start praising Him in spite of it. Yeah. You see, you can't, if you let your circumstances dictate to you, you can just pull the plug. Right. See, there are people who are not here today because they just didn't feel like it coming. You know, I didn't feel like coming today either, just so you know. You don't go to church because you feel like it. You go to church because it's the right thing to do. And if you get here feeling bad, if you start worshiping God, you get to feeling better. I know the mic must not be on. At the end of six months, they did scans. And the doctor met with me and he said, Pastor, uh, we can't give you any more chemo. We'll kill you if you give, we give you any more chemo. Your body cannot take any more chemotherapy. And there's still stuff in your chest. I said, I'm good. That's 23 years now. Can anybody rejoice with me? Can anybody rejoice with me? Some of you, I'm going to just praise God for you because you can't rejoice with me. See, I know a miracle working God. See, God kept me alive to be here to irritate you today. I'm so glad he did. Because the worst problem in the world is apathy. It's business as usual. See, I want you mad or glad when you live here today. I just don't want you indifferent any longer. Amen. John, I'm here. You thought you were by yourself on this island? No, 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 no. I'm he who was dead. But now I'm alive forevermore. And I've got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I got the key to unlock you situation, John. And so the story today is about this. In the middle of whatever's going on in your life right now, if you'll make a decision, the first decision is this. In spite of what I'm feeling, in spite of what's going on around me, I'm going to worship God. Yeah, come on. The second decision you've got to make today is to turn and look at Jesus. Because if you can see him today in all of his glory and majesty and power, you know that he's adequate for whatever you face and whatever you're dealing with. Hallelujah.